The professor had turned into a street to the left and walked along with his head carried rigidly erect in a crowd whose every individual almost overtopped his stunted stature. It was vain to pretend to himself that he was not disappointed. But that was mere feeling. The stoicism of his thought could not be disturbed by this or any other failure. Next time, or the time after next, a telling stroke would be delivered, something really startling, a blow fit to open the first crack in the imposing front of the great edifice of legal conceptions sheltering the atrocious injustice of society, of humble origin and with an appearance really so mean as to stand in the way of his considerable natural abilities. His imagination had been fired early by the tales of men rising from the depths of poverty to positions of authority and affluence. The extreme, almost ascetic purity of his thought, combined with an astounding ignorance of worldly conditions, had set before him a goal of power and prestige to be attained without the medium of arts, graces, tact, wealth, by sheer weight of merit alone. On that view, he considered himself entitled to undisputed success. His father, a delicate, dark enthusiast with a sloping forehead, had been an itinerant and rousing preacher of some obscure, rigid Christian sect a man supremely confident in the privileges of his righteousness. In the son, individualist by temperament, once the science of colleges had replaced thoroughly the faith of conventicles, this moral attitude translated itself into a frenzied puritanism of ambition. He nursed it as something secularly holy, to see it thwarted, opened his eyes to the true nature of the world, whose morality was artificial, corrupt, and blasphemous. The way of even the most justifiable revolutions is prepared by personal impulses disguised into creeds. The professor's indignation found itself a final cause that absolved him from the sin of turning to destruction as the agent of his ambition. To destroy public faith and legality was the imperfect formula of his pedantic fanaticism. But the subconscious conviction that the framework of an established social order cannot be effectively shattered except by some form of collective or individual violence, was precise and correct. He was a moral agent. That was settled in his mind. By exercising his agency with ruthless defiance, he procured for himself the appearances of power and personal prestige. That was undeniable to his vengeful bitterness. It pacified its unrest and, in their own way, the most ardent of revolutionaries are perhaps doing no more but seeking for peace in common with the rest of mankind, the peace of soothed vanity, of satisfied appetites, or perhaps of appeased conscience. Lost in the crowd, miserable and undersized, he meditated confidently on his power, keeping his hand in the left pocket of his trousers, grasping lightly the India-rubber ball, the supreme guarantee of his sinister freedom. But after a while he became disagreeably affected by the sight of the roadway thronged with vehicles and of the pavement crowded with men and women. He was in a long, straight street, peopled by a mere fraction of an immense multitude, but all round him, on and on, even to the limits of the horizon, hidden by the enormous piles of bricks, he felt the mass of mankind mighty in its numbers, 
They swarmed numerous like locusts, industrious like ants, thoughtless like a natural force, pushing on blind and orderly and absorbed, impervious to sentiment, to logic, to terror too, perhaps. That was the form of doubt he feared most, impervious to fear, often while walking abroad, when he happened also to come out of himself, he had such moments of dreadful and sane mistrust of mankind. What if nothing could move them? Such moments come to all men whose ambition aims at a direct grasp upon humanity, to artists, politicians, thinkers, reformers, or saints. A despicable emotional state, this, against which solitude fortifies a superior character, and with severe exaltation the professor thought of the refuge of his room, with its padlocked cupboard, lost in a wilderness of poor houses, the hermitage of the perfect anarchist, in order to reach sooner the point where he could take his omnibus. He turned brusquely out of the populous street, into a narrow and dusky alley paved with the flagstones. On one side the low brick houses had in their dusty windows the sightless, moribund look of incurable decay, empty shells awaiting demolition. From the other side life had not departed wholly as yet. Facing the only gas lamp yawned the cavern of a second-hand furniture dealer, where, deep in the gloom of a sort of narrow avenue winding through a bizarre forest of wardrobes with an undergrowth tangle of table legs, a tall pier glass glimmered like a pool of water in a wood, an unhappy homeless couch accompanied by two unrelated chairs stood in the open. The only human being making use of the alley, besides the professor, coming stalwart and erect from the opposite direction, checked his swinging pace suddenly. Hello, he said, and stood a little on one side, watchfully. The professor had already stopped, with a ready half-turn which brought his shoulders very near the other wall. His right hand fell lightly on the back of the outcast couch. The left remained purposely plunged deep in the trousers' pocket, and the roundness of the heavy-rimmed spectacles imparted an owlish character to his moody, unperturbed face. It was like a meeting inside a corridor of a mansion full of life, the stalwart man was buttoned up in a dark overcoat and carried an umbrella. His hat, tilted back, uncovered a good deal of forehead, which appeared very white in the dusk. In the dark patches of the orbits, the eyeballs glimmered piercingly, long, drooping mustaches, the color of ripe corn, framed with their points the square block of his shaved chin. I am not looking for you, he said curtly. The professor did not stir an inch. The blended noises of the enormous town sank down to an inarticulate low murmur. Chief Inspector Heat of the Special Crimes Department changed his tone. Not in a hurry to get home, he asked with mocking simplicity. The unwholesome-looking little moral agent of destruction exulted silently in the possession of personal prestige, keeping in check this man armed with the defensive mandate of a menaced society. More fortunate than Caligula, who wished that the Roman Senate had only one head for the better satisfaction of his cruel lust, he beheld and that one man all the forces he had set at defiance, the force of law, property, oppression, and injustice. He beheld all his enemies, and fearlessly confronted 
all in a supreme satisfaction of his vanity, they stood perplexed before him, as if before a dreadful portent. He gloated inwardly of the chance of this meeting, affirming his superiority over all the multitude of mankind. It was in reality a chance meeting. Chief Inspector Heat had had a disagreeably busy day since his department received the first telegram from Greenwich a little before eleven in the morning. First of all, the fact of the outrage being attempted less than a week after he had assured a high official that no outbreak of anarchist activity was to be apprehended was sufficiently annoying. If he ever thought himself safe in making a statement, it was then. He had made that statement with an infinite satisfaction to himself, because it was clear that the high official desired greatly to hear that very thing. He had affirmed that nothing of the sort could even be thought of without the department being aware of it within twenty-four hours, and he had spoken thus in his consciousness of being the expert of his department. He had gone even so far as to utter words which true wisdom would have kept back. But Chief Inspector Heat was not very wise, at least not truly so. True wisdom, which is not certain of anything in this world of contradictions, would have prevented him from attaining his present position, it would have alarmed his superiors and done away with his chances of promotion. His promotion had been very rapid. There isn't one of them, sir, that we couldn't lay our hands on at any time of night and day. We know what each of them is doing, hour by hour, he had declared, and the high official had deigned to smile. This was so obviously the right thing to say for an officer of Chief Inspector Heat's reputation that it was perfectly delightful. The high official believed the declaration, which chimed in with his idea of the fitness of things. His wisdom was of an official kind, or else he might have reflected upon a matter not of theory but of experience that in the close-woven stuff of relations between conspirator and police there occur unexpected solutions of continuity, sudden holes in space and time. A given anarchist may be watched inch by inch and minute by minute, but a moment always comes when somehow all sight and touch of him are lost for a few hours, during which something, generally an explosion more or less deplorable, does happen. But the high official, carried away by a sense of the fitness of things, had smiled, and now the recollection of that smile was very annoying to Chief Inspector Heat, principal expert in anarchist procedure. This was not the only circumstance whose recollection depressed the usual serenity of the eminent specialist. There was another dating back only to that very morning. The thought that when called urgently to his assistant commissioner's private room, he had been unable to conceal his astonishment was distinctly vexing. His instinct of a successful man had taught him long ago that, as a general rule, a reputation is built on manner as much as on achievement, and he felt that his manner, when confronted with the telegram, had not been impressive. He had opened his eyes widely, and had exclaimed, Impossible! exposing himself thereby to the unanswerable retort of a fingertip laid forcibly on the telegram which the assistant commissioner, after reading it aloud, had flung on the desk. To be crushed, as it were, under the tip of a forefinger was an unpleasant experience. Very damaging, too, 
Furthermore, Chief Inspector Heat was conscious of not having mended matters by allowing himself to express a conviction. One thing I can tell you at once, none of our lot had anything to do with this. He was strong in his integrity of a good detective, but he saw now that in impenetrably attentive reserve towards this incident would have served his reputation better. On the other hand, he admitted to himself that it was difficult to preserve one's reputation if rank outsiders were going to take a hand in the business. Outsiders are the bane of the police, as of other professions. The tone of the assistant commissioner's remarks had been sour enough to set one's teeth on edge. And since breakfast, Chief Inspector Heat had not managed to get anything to eat. Starting immediately to begin his investigation on the spot, he had swallowed a good deal of raw, unwholesome fog in the park. Then he walked over to the hospital, and when the investigation in Greenwich was concluded at last, he had lost his inclination for food. Not accustomed, as the doctors are, to examine closely the mangled remains of human beings, he had been shocked by the sight disclosed to his view when a waterproof sheet had been lifted off a table in a certain apartment of the hospital. Another waterproof sheet was spread over that table in the manner of a tablecloth, with the corners turned up over a sort of mound, a heap of rags, scorched and blood-stained, half concealing what might have been an accumulation of raw material for a cannibal feast. It required considerable firmness of mind not to recoil before that sight. Chief Inspector Heat, an efficient officer of his department, stood his ground. But for a whole minute he did not advance. A local constable in uniform cast a sidelong glance and said, with stolid simplicity, He's all there, every bit of him. It was a job. He had been the first man on the spot after the explosion. He mentioned the fact again. He had seen something like a heavy flash of lightning in the fog. At that time he was standing at the door of the King William Street Lodge, talking to the keeper. The concussion made him tingle all over. He ran between the trees towards the observatory. As fast as my legs could carry me, he repeated twice. Chief Inspector Heat, bending forward over the table in a gingerly and horrified manner, let him run on. The hospital porter and another man turned down the corners of the cloth and stepped aside. The Chief Inspector's eyes searched the gruesome detail of that heap of mixed things, which seemed to have been collected in shambles and rag shops. You used a shovel, he remarked, observing a sprinkling of small gravel, tiny brown bits of bark, and particles of splintered wood as fine as needles. Had to in one place, said the stolid constable. I sent a keeper to fetch a spade. When he had heard me scraping the ground with it, he leaned his forehead against a tree and was as sick as a dog. The chief inspector, stooping guardedly over the table, fought down the unpleasant sensation in his throat. The shattering violence of destruction which made of that body a heap of nameless fragments affected his feelings with a sense of ruthless cruelty, though his reason told him the effect must have been as swift as a flash of lightning. The man, whoever he was, had died instantaneously, and yet it seemed impossible to believe that a human body could have reached that state of disintegration 
without passing through the pangs of inconceivable agony. No physiologist, and still less a metaphysician, Chief Inspector Heat rose by the force of sympathy, which is a form of fear, above the vulgar conception of time. Instantaneous. He remembered all he had read in popular publications of long and terrifying dreams, dreamed in the instant of waking, of the whole past life, lived with frightful intensity by a drowning man, as his doomed head bobs up, streaming for the last time. The inexplicable mysteries of conscious existence beset Chief Inspector Heat till he evolved a horrid notion that ages of atrocious pain and mental torture could be contained between two successive winks of an eye. And, meantime, the chief inspector went on, peering at the table with a calm face and the slightly anxious attention of an indigent customer bending over what may be called the by-products of a butcher's shop with a view to an inexpensive Sunday dinner. All the time, his trained faculties of an excellent investigator who scorns no chance of information followed the self-satisfied, disjointed loquacity of the constable. A fair-haired fellow, the last, observed in a placid tone, and paused. The old woman, who spoke to the sergeant, noticed a fair-haired fellow coming out of Mays Hill Station. He paused, and he was a fair-haired fellow. She noticed Two men coming out of the station after the up-train had gone on, he continued slowly. She couldn't tell if they were together. She took no particular notice of the big one, but the other was a fair, slight chap, carrying a tin varnish can in one hand. The constable ceased. Know the woman, muttered the chief inspector, with his eyes fixed on the table, and a vague notion in his mind of an inquest to be held presently upon a person likely to remain forever unknown. Yes, she is housekeeper to a retired publican, and attends the chapel in Park Place sometimes. The constable uttered weightily and paused, with another oblique glance at the table. Then, suddenly, well, here he is, all of him I could see, fair, slight, slight enough. Look at that foot there. I picked up the legs first, one after another. He was that scattered. You didn't know where to begin. The constable paused, the least flicker of an innocent self-laudatory smile invested his round face with an infantile expression. Stumbled, he announced positively. I stumbled once myself, and pitched on my head, too, while running up. Them roots do stick out, all about the place. Stumbled against the root of a tree and fell, and that thing he was carrying must have gone off right under his chest, I expect. The echo of the words, person unknown, repeating itself in his inner consciousness, bothered the chief inspector considerably. He would have liked to trace this affair back to its mysterious origin for his own information. He was professionally curious. Before the public, he would have liked to vindicate the efficiency of his department by establishing the identity of that man. He was a loyal servant. That, however, appeared impossible. The first term of the problem was unreadable, lacked all suggestion but that of atrocious cruelty. Overcoming his physical repugnance, Chief Inspector Heat stretched out his hand without conviction for the salving of his conscience, and took up the least soiled of the rags. It was a narrow strip of velvet, with a larger triangular piece of dark blue cloth hanging from it. He held it up to his eyes, 
and the police constable spoke. Velvet collar. Funny, the old woman should have noticed the velvet collar. Dark blue overcoat with a velvet collar, she has told us. He was the chap she saw, and no mistake. And here he is, all complete, velvet collar and all. I don't think I missed a single piece as big as a postage stamp. At this point, the trained faculties of the chief inspector ceased to hear the voice of the constable. He moved to one of the windows for better light. His face, averted from the room, expressed a startled, intense interest while he examined closely the triangular piece of broadcloth. By a sudden jerk, he detached it and only, after stuffing it into his pocket, turned round to the room and flung the velvet collar back on the table. Cover up, he directed the attendant curtly, without another look, and saluted by the constable, carried off his spoil hastily.